Should we start? Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And this is Pursue 3H, which is soft tissue tumors. We are streaming live from Hyderabad via Kolkata. And this is the 150th lecture on the Neelam Path lecture series. A big thank you to everyone. Today's topic is very interesting and very much in demand, which is vascular malformation and vascular tumors. And the speaker is much more in demand, a person who's an expert in soft tissue tumors. She's already taken four lectures on the Neelam lecture series on soft tissue tumors and has been appreciated by everybody nationally as well as internationally. She is Dr. Gyud Gitanjali. She's an MBBS MD pathology from PGI Chandigarh, a DM in histopathology from PGI Chandigarh, a consultant in care hospital and a consultant in Vijaya Diagnostic Center, Hyderabad. Before I ask her to start, let me request all of you to keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Madam Gitanjali, ma'am, please share your screen and let's start. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely yes. clear. We can see your screen also. Please start. Okay, thank you, sir. So, uh, starting with the vascular tumors or the vascular malformations. So, the International Society for Vascular Anomalies have classified the vascular lesions into malformations and tumors. So, malformations are the abnormally developed vessels which are present since birth and grow with as the person grows whereas vascular tumors are the overgrowth of the vascular tissue and they form into an organized structure so the basic difference is the mal organization of the vascular channels and vascular malformations and tumors is like a tumor like lesion which is very much organized but on pathology we cannot actually always differentiate between a tumor and a malformation it is mostly because of the clinical backup we can say whether it, which is helpful to say whether it's a tumor and malformations so first starting with the vascular tumors now the who 2020 or the fifth edition has classified these tumors just like any other soft tissues into benign intermediate and the malignant categories the benign categories are the various hemangiomas and the lymphangiomas which are the benign vascular tumors involving the venous channels, capillary channels and the lymphatic channels and in malignant we have the angiosarcoma which has the poor prognosis and epithelioid hemangioendothelioma and previously the Kaposi sarcoma was included in the malignant category but now Kaposi sarcoma is removed from the malignant category because it does not have as poor prognosis as the other malignant tumors and the patient though there is uh, metastasis and frequent recurrences we don't see death due to that much death due to Kaposi sarcoma so now under malignant vascular tumors we have angiosarcoma epithelioid hemangioendothelioma and in hep epithelioid hemangioendothelioma there is a characteristic molecular fusion which is wwtr1 and camta1 which is seen in more than 50 per 90 percent of the cases whereas uh, recently this new fusion gene was uh, also identified which is yav1 tfe3 which i will discuss in further slides and uh, in intermediate category we have 
two groups which are locally aggressive group and the rarely metastasizing groups within this we can see the kaposi form hemangioendothelioma retiform hemangioendothelioma papillary angioendothelioma the composite hemangioendothelioma and pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma those although all these tumors have this common term of hemangioendothelioma there is no morphological relation or any molecular relation between hemangioendothelioma so when we give a diagnosis of hemangioendothelioma Ma, we should specify what type of hemangioendothelioma it is. Just saying hemangioendothelioma doesn't make any sense. So first, we'll start with the malignant tumor, which is angiosarcoma. So it has a very poor prognosis, with more than fifty percent of patients dying within one year of diagnosis. And the peak age of incidence is elderly people in their second decade of life. However, it can occur over a wide age range, and it is extremely rare in children but it can occur in children and it has propensity towards the male gender and based upon the clinical presentation we have a uh, five we can categorize them into five different types first one is the primary cutaneous angiosarcomas which are not associated with lymphedema or the radiation this uh, unlike the other malignant soft tissue tumors which are usually deeply located the angiosarcomas is superficially located in the cutaneous region and it is said that it occurs in the head and neck region which is sun exposed but there is no etiology or etiopathogenic relationship between the sun exposure and angiosarcomas unlike that of melanomas so primary cutaneous occurs commonly in the head and neck region Other one is the lymphedema associated angiosarcoma, which occurs uh, after post chronic lymphedema, especially after the post mastectomy. And then we have the post irradiation angiosarcomas. These are more common in the abdomen after irradiation given to the cervix and the uterus. But now, even in the uh, breast irradiation post therapy, we are also seeing post irradiation angiosarcomas in breast and the chest region. Then we have angiosarcomas of deep soft tissue and angiosarcomas present in parenchymal organs like bone, liver, spleen, lung, breast, in and also heart. And within the heart, it is most common in the right atrium. So, clinic coming to the clinical presentation, the angiosarcoma in the early stage can present like a small ecchymotic patch or a bilateral papule, which later increases in size and becomes nodular with the uh, ulceration and uh, grossly the angiosarcoma if we look at this cutaneous angiosarcoma we can see presence of this hemorrhagic lesion which is in the dermis and it is also present deeply extending till the subcutaneous tissue and through all layers of this scalp and uh, it can cut surface it has like multiple spongy appearance with extensive areas of hemorrhage and again the gross appearance of angiosarcomas depends upon the how well differentiated it is if it is a well differentiated angiosarcoma we can see presence of extensive hemorrhage and the spongy consistency whereas in case of poorly differentiated angiosarcoma where we see solid tumor cells in microscopy the grossly it will be looking like a grayish white fleshy mass coming to the microscopic features of angiosarcoma in microscopy the morphology is very varied and it can be as benign looking which the well differentiated angiosarcoma can be so benign looking that it is difficult to differentiate between a benign vascular tumor and angiosarcoma to a poorly differentiated it has a wide spectrum of morphology so while looking at angiosarcoma we should be uh, aware of all the findings and see it step by step to see we are not under diagnosing or over diagnosing a condition so in this we can see this is a case of cutaneous angiosarcoma the pictures i have taken from the books of enzinger so this is the epidermis and this is the dermis we can see that there are variable le shaped vascular channels and these are all anastomosing and dissecting deep into the dermis 
and these are very irregular in shape and this is the most important first finding which you have to see in the low power which is dissection through the multiple planes like it dissects from the dermis and also extends into the subcutaneous tissue and these are anastomotic vascular channels and they are of varying size and if we look at the border it is not a well circumscribed lesion rather it will be very ill defined lesion with irregular borders and in higher power we can see that these uh, vascular lesions they surround all this dermal collagen causing entrapment of the uh, dermal collagen and it gives a characteristic cracking appearance which is seen in the dermal collagen separating off each of the collagen fibers and it also like circumferentially infiltrates the adnexal structures and separates out this adnexal structure from the adjoining tissue which is the isolating of the adnexal structure and it when it infiltrates into the subcutaneous fat it causes splitting apart of the subcutaneous fat cells and if we go into the cytomorphology these cells show atypia but sometimes we may not see that much of profound nuclear atypia but we should uh, be aware of the features like prominence of nucleoli pleomorphism and one more clue which helps in identifying the atp and angiosarcoma is multilayering so if we find any multilayering of the cells and uh, uh, any papillary intraepithelial proliferation it is more favors angiosarcoma apart from this presence of nuclear atp and uh, nucleoli and mitotic activity also favors a diagnosis of a well differentiated angiosarcoma so this is all though the theoretical aspect we can say multiple points but when we come to a case it becomes difficult to diagnose a very well differentiated angiosarcoma especially in the small core biopsies where we cannot find each and every feature which is described so this is a case which is shared i am thankful to dr kanyapan who has shared this case with me and this is a core biopsy of a breast of a 33 year old female and clinically they said it is a 6 by 6 cm lobulated reddish blue mass which is present for one month and we have received this biopsy of the breast and within this biopsy we can see there are numerous vascular channels dissecting through the multiple planes and they are like slit like spaces and astomosing they are of varying shape we cannot find any well defined uh, lesion but they are all dissecting through the dermal collagen but when we come to the cytomorphology we cannot find much of the nuclear atypia there is no nucleoli however the cells the endothelial cells which are lining this vascular channels are definitely prominent they are not like the flattened endothelial cell of a benign or a reactive lesion and mitosis was also not that much found we can do ihc markers for the pan endothelial marker pan endothelial immunohistochemistry marker like cd31 34 erg but it will not help us to differentiate whether it is a benign vascular lesion or a malignant tumor because all of the endothelial cells will be positive in those markers and ki67 was done which is also low so we asked them advised to do the excision of this breast biopsy so this is a resected specimen in in the resected specimen we can see this is the epidermis and within the dermis and into the breast parenchyma these are the small small slit like vascular channels which are of varying size and anastomosing there is dissection through the multiple planes deep into the dermis and if we see these channels some of them are isolating this ductal epithelial uh, the ductal structures of the breast and the cells in some areas we have found the ones which are very prominent and showing nuclear atp and hyperchromatia they are also isolating the small snr structures separating them and mitotic figures were also found so this is a case of a very well differentiated angiosarcoma and it is a very difficult diagnosis in a breast because most of the breast angiosarcomas are very well differentiated 
and uh, this is one more case which i want to share with you and this was the case which was presented and shared with us by dr sanjay kakkar when he visited pgi in 2018 this is a 33 year male with hepatomegaly ascites and jaundice they have done work up for liver disease which is negative there are no hepatic or extra hepatic masses so this is a picture of a liver so probably since we are in the topic of angiosarcomas it is very easy easy to appreciate that there is a plate like spread of these cells which are very prominent and there is cracking effect which is separating this hepatocyte cords but when we initially saw most of us couldn't find anything significant in this and it is very easy to miss because of this banal morphology but if we see look at this sinusoids there are very much atypical prominent cells with enlarged hypergrammatic nuclei and in liver it can have this kind of a uh, spread along the sinusoidal space in a plate like entrapping the hepatocytic plate and it doesn't present as a mass like lesion like in this it just presented with hepatomegaly and this was a very interesting case so that is one spectrum of angiosarcomas which are difficult to diagnose which are the very well differentiated ones and coming to the other spectrum are the poorly differentiated angiosarcomas so when the poorly differentiated ones can have either a spindle cell morphology present in diffuse areas or in interlacing fascicles or it can also be an epitheloid morphology called as epitheloid angiosarcomas and in both of these look like any undifferentiated pleomorphic sarc comas and it is difficult to identify that these are angiosarcomas unless until we are lucky to find some of the vasoformative areas like here we can see some slit like spaces or vasoformation within which there is hemorrhage and even here you can see these like vaso vessel formation is there and it is lined by the tumor cells within which capillaries are present but it's not very easy to appreciate this every time because of the procedure induced hemorrhage and we can it it produces an, an artifactual uh, thing where we can see some extra vasated rbcs and uh, that is confusing whether it is a vasoformative lesion or it is a hemorrhage and this epitheloid heman epitheloid uh, angiosarcoma is positive for cytokeratin and then if when we do the vascular marker it will come positive for cd34 so it is a differential diagnosis for all other epitheloid tumors like starting with carcinoma and uh, poorly differentiated melanoma only on morphology and other important differential diagnosis is epitheloid sarcoma which also show ck positivity and cd34 positivity so we should do ini1 and other epitheloid uh, variants of sarcomas like leiomyosarcomas and to identify that these malignant tumors are of vascular origin we can do the endothelial markers the endothelial markers available are cd31 it has a higher specificity when compared to cd34 and higher sensitivity but we should be very careful while interpretation because some macrophages also show some irregular granular positivity for cd31 so we should be careful while interpreting ihc whether we are looking at macrophage or a tumor cell positivity and cd34 is has a moderate specificity and high sensitivity but there are many other tumors which are also superficial in location and mimic the angiosarcomas like epitheloid sarcoma which has epitheloid morphology dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberance which is also superficial in location it can be a differential for spindle cell angiosarcomas and other tumors which show ce34 positivity are the solitary fibrous tumor and gastrointestinal stroma tumor and we also have many superficial cd34 positive fibroblastic tumors and they also come into a differential diagnosis with this vascular tumors and other marker of endothelium is the von willebrand factor though it has high specificity and but the sensitivity is low and there is lot of technical challenges while performing this immunohistochemistry other markers are fli1 and erg and fli1 and erg produce a nuclear staining they have a very high sensitivity but not very specific as they are also seen in other tumors and not specific for a vascular tumor so it is always recommended to do either cd31 or 34 preferably 31 and then to confirm 
proceed to FLI1 and ERG and not outright start with FLI1 and ERG. So coming to the molecular genetic aspects of angiosarcomas, in angiosarcomas there is upregulation of the vascular specific receptor tyrosine kinases because of which uh, there we can give a targeted tyrosine kinase receptor therapy against KDR or vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2 like sorifenib and uh, sunitinib and this uh, BEGF R2 mutation is seen in both primary as well as secondary angiosarcomas. Whereas MIC amplification on chromosome 8q24 is a hallmark of secondary angiosarcomas which occur post-radiation and lymphedema associated angiosarcomas and even FLT4 which encodes through vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 3 co-amplification is also seen in 25% of cases of secondary angiosarcomas. So this is very helpful to identify the atypical vascular region, atypical vascular lesion, which are a continuum of vascular lesions post radiation from a post radiation induced angiosarcomas. So, atypical vascular lesions are a completely benign lesions, but they develop follow radiation and they have some of the features of angiosarcomas. So, there is an overlap of these lesions with angiosarcomas, posing a diagnostic difficulty. and uh, the morphological features of angiosarcoma which are seen in atypical vascular lesions are there are vascular channels of irregular shape and size, anastomosing. They also dissect through dermal collagen. But instead of being a diffuse multinodular or ill-defined margins, they are relatively circumscribed. They rarely infiltrate into subcutaneous fat. And the cytomorphological features like profound nuclear atypia, nucleoli, multilayering of cells or mitotic activity is not found in atypical uh, vascular lesion. And atypical vascular lesions have a lymphatic type and a capillary venous type. In the lymphatic type, we can see these are the dilated vascular channels of varying size and they are present in the multiple planes dissecting through the collagen. And here they are slightly prominent with nuclear hyperchromatia, though we cannot appreciate prominent nucleoli and no mitotic activity. But still many times the, it is, the assessment of atypia is very subjective and we cannot completely rely on our judgment. And in that cases, it is very helpful to do this semic immunohistochemistry or FISH study for semic amplification or FLT4 amplification. As the post-radiation induced angiosarcomas or secondary angiosarcomas are associated with MIC amplification. Moving on to the next malignant entity, which is the epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. This epithelioid hemangioendothelioma occurs in a relatively younger population in comparison to angiosarcomas, and the peak incidence is in fourth and fifth decade. And they are mostly multifocal in lesion, and they occur in various visceral sites and deep soft tissues. They occur in lung, kidneys, liver, bones, or any site, and they can also be superficial, located in skin and soft tissue, and during the presentation in skin, they are usually solitary. In coming to the morphology, they are usually present as an angiocentric lesions. And then they spread into the surrounding uh, soft tissues. So here if we see in this picture, this is a vessel. And within the vessel, the tumor is filling up the total vessel. This is, these are the tumor cells which are present in this fibromyxoid background. Then from the vessel, they spread centrifugally into the surrounding soft tissue. So coming to the morphology of the epithelioid uh, hemangioendotheliomas, though they are vascular lesions, they lack vasoformation. That is, no vascular formation is noted. Rather, they are arranged in a cord-like pattern resembling that of a lobular car carcinoma of breast. And the background is rich in sulfate and has a mixo highline kind of background and this individual tumor cells show presence of intracytoplasmic lumina which are also called as blister cells so these are the characteristic morphological features of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma despite that look of being like a uh, arrangement of a lobular carcinomas epithelioid morphology these are also positive for cytokeratin so we should be very cautious not to interpret these as carcinomas.
and uh, more than 90% of cases have a characteristic translocation of 1,3 3 with a WWTR1 and Kanta 1 fusion and that is an immunohistochemistry available for Kanta 1 which can be performed in these cases apart from the uh, markers for endothelium like CD31 and 34. And in the recent WHO, a new entity was described in within a new subdivision within hemangio, epithelial hemangioendothelioma is described, which has this characteristic YAF1 TFE3 gene fusion. Gene fusion. And uh, in these tumors, these have a very distinctive histological features which are different from that of the classical epithelial hemangioendotheliomas, like we don't have this cord-like arrangement which is seen there, rather there is a solid growth pattern and the cells have very abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and vasoformation is identified in these cases with abundant cytoplasm. They can also show presence of inflammation in the background matrix and these morphology can be merging with a classical epithelioid hemangioendothelioma and studies have shown they have this characteristic YAP1 TFE3 gene fusion. They express the pan endothelial cell markers and we can also do immunohistochemistry for TFE3 which shows nuclear positivity for confirmation of these tumors. So coming to the next category, which are the intermediate category of vascular tumors, which rarely metastasize and they have a frequent local recurrences. So first is the pseudomyogenic uh, hemangioendothelioma. So this is a differential diagnosis for another epithelioid tumors or sarcomas with epithelioid morphology. And uh, this is also known as epithelioid sarcoma like hemangioendothelioma. And it presents as a multiple discontinuous nodules in different tissue planes. It is present in the skin. It presents as a cutaneous lesion in the skin and infiltrate. it can infiltrate the dermis, subcutaneous tissue and also occasionally into the bones. Coming to the morphology, it can have a spindle morphology or an epithelioid morphology and it has an abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and it mimics the rhabdomyoblast and uh, one of the other soft pointer is in the background of these tumors we see presence of many neutrophils. So it mimics rhabdomyoblast by having that kind of morphology with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm but when we do immunohistochemistry these tumors do not express desmin, myogen and myod or any of the tumors of muscle differentiation. These are positive for cytokeratin like other epithelial tumors and they around 50% uh, show positivity for CD31. So it is not consistently positive whereas it's negative for CD34 and it has a characteristic translocation of 7, 19 with serpine 1 and FOSB fusion. So FOSB immunohistochemistry is available to, uh, which is a surrogate marker of fusion for identifying this pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. This is also the new entity which is included in the new WH. Coming to the next entity which is the reti form hemangioendothelioma. This is a very rare form of hemangioendothelioma occurring in young adults and children. It is common in the distal, it occurs in the distal extremities of skin and subcutaneous tissue and few cases follow setting of previous radiotherapy, pre-existing lymphoma or a cystic lymphangioma. As the name suggests the reti form, we have this long vascular channels or the vessels which are compressed and they are dissecting through the multiple layers of the uh, dermis and they resemble the reti testis which we see in the testis so it is named as retiform hemangioendothelioma and the cells which are lining these vascular channels have a characteristic hobnailing appearance however they don't show much of atypia and no mitotic activity is present and these cells are positive for panendothelial markers and they also express a lymphatic marker prox 2 but it is negative for other lymphatic markers like podoplanin it is just positive for prox 2 uh, other category of this rarely metastasizing intermediate tumors are the intralymphatic angioendothelioma this is a intermediate tumor which shows a lymphatic differentiation and it is common in the proximal extremities especially the buttercot type and less common than the distal extremities 
and it can also occur in intra-abdominal and parenchymal sites including testes and it can also be seen in the bone intra-osseous locations are rarely reported. As I said, this is like an intermediate tumor which is showing lymphatic differentiation even though morphology resembles that of a cavernous hemangioma in a low power. We see presence of this large cavernous spaces and outside this cavernous spaces there is a dense lymphocytic inflammation with formation of nodules and within this cavernous spaces we see presence of this intraluminal papillary proliferations. And these papillae are lined by this matchstick like columnar hobnail cells. And these tumors express both pan endothelial markers and also all lymphatic markers, including LY, the lymphatic vascular endothelial marker, PROX2, and Chloroplan. Coming to the next category, which is a composite hemangioendothelioma. This is a very rare hemangioendothelioma and occurs in the distal extremities, head and neck and oral cavity. And according to definition, to call something as a composite hemangioendothelioma, it should have two patterns which are morphologically distinct. Like we can, this is a example of retiform hemangioendothelioma with this rated testis like compressed vascular channels showing prominent hobnail. And adjacent to this, there is a tumor which is showing morphology of that of a epithelial hemangioendothelioma with some cord-like cells and present in a mixohyaline background. So if we see any two combination of two tumors, we call it under, we put it under a composite hemangioendothelioma. And apart from this, there were also some cases described where they have seen a combination of angiosarcomas with this and they have put it under a composite hemangioendothelioma rather than a malignant vascular tumor, which is an angiosarcoma. So the criteria is not exactly defined when to call it as angiosarcoma and when as composite hemangioendothelioma. So it is a bit controversial and making the diagnosis of composite Hemangioendothelioma with the combination of angiosarcoma is bit treacherous. And uh, recently, a uh, variant in composite hemangioendothelioma is described, which expresses a neuroendocrine like marker. In this variant, there is combination of tumors which are having retiform hemangioendothelioma like pattern or epithelial hemangioendothelioma like pattern without a characteristic mixohyaline stroma. And there are which are intermingling with regions which have a neuroendocrine uh, sort of arrangement with epithelioid and spindle cells present in this nesting pattern. If you see in this picture, the nesting pattern of spindle cells and epithelioid cells resemble that of a neuroendocrine tumor. And this tumor shows positivity for neuroendocrine marker, which is synaptophysin. Chromogranin is not constantly expressed. And these were called as composite hemangioendothelioma with nuclear marker expression. And this is an aggressive variant. And on doing the molecular genetic studies, they found a normal PT VP1 MML2 and EBC1 PHC2 fusion. So this is a new category of entity which is also included in the recent WH. Moving on to the next uh, intermediate malignancy, which is a Kaposi sarcoma. So Kaposi sarcoma is a viral induced, HH human herpes virus 8 induced, multifocal vascular proliferation. Clinically, there are four variants of Kaposi sarcomas, which are the classical indolent variant, which occurs commonly in the elderly individuals in the distal extremities, and an endemic African variant, which can occur in wide range, age range, and also in children. An iatrogenic Kaposi sarcoma, which develops post renal transplant or post immunosuppressive therapy, and the AIDS associated Kaposi sarcoma, which is a most aggressive form of Kaposi sarcoma seen in HIV patients. And uh, on the gross clinical features, it presents like uh, three stages. First stage, which has a, a plaque like presentation, bilaceous plaque, and then moving on to patch stage where it can be pigmented, followed by a nodular or the tumor stage. So the classical or indolent form occurs in elderly patients, it occurs in distal extremities and cutaneous sites. Mucosal or visceral involvement is very rare in case of classical or indolent Kaposi sarcoma. In the African endemic form, it has an aggressive forms where 
uh, uh, one from presence in children with a diffuse lymphadenopathy with corpus sarcoma occur in lymph nodes and there is an aggressive cutaneous forms which can also have bone involvement and there is one more form which is a cutaneous indolent form which, re which resembles the classical Kaposi sarcoma and then the hydrogenic Kaposi sarcoma are also cutaneous in location and but the AIDS induced Kaposi sarcoma are the most aggressive which can occur in varied sites including face, genitals, lower extremities, mucosal sites, lymph nodes, gastrointestinal tract and lungs. Coming to the morphology, like I said, there are three stages, which are the plaque, patch, and then the nodular stage. And based upon this stage, we have an intermixture of uh, vascular channels and the spindle cells. So in the early stages, we have this lymphatic-like vascular channels, which are infiltrating here. And in addition to this, we see a lot of inflammation in the surrounding area. And these lymphatic channels are dissecting through the collagen. And... Uh, but in contrast to the angiosarcomas, the cells which are lining these vascular channels don't show any profound nuclear ATP or prominence of nucleoli or uh, multi-layering, which is the most important feature in angiosarcoma, is not seen in this Kaposi sarcoma. But they surround these adenexal structures, causing this pr uh, protrusion into the lumen, which is a promontory sign, most commonly which is a diagnostic sign appreciated in the Kaposi sarcoma. And later to the path stage, there is a increased proliferation of the spindle cells along with inflammation. And in the tumoral stage, we see a lot of spindle cell proliferation, which is more cellular, forming a tumor-like mass. So the spindle cells of the Kaposi sarcoma are arranged in a fascicular pattern and they show presence of these highland globules. Within this spindle cells, we can see some of these slit-like vascular spaces which are showing extravasated RBCs. We find many uh, nuclear uh, mitotic activity is frequently found in Kaposi sarcoma. And there is also a lot of hemorrhage with hemosiderin laden macrophages and lymphocytic inflammation. The presence of hemosiderin laden macrophages is again one more pointer which helps us to differentiate the artifactual hemorrhage of cutting or the procedure from the true hemorrhage. And in case of nodular stage, there is a predominance of the spindle cell, but at the periphery of the tumor, we can still find presence of these lymphatic channels present as crescentric or well-formed channels at the periphery of the lesion. So, Kaposi sarcoma are positive for all the endothelial markers. In addition, it also expresses the lymphatic marker, which is podoplanin. And the confirmatory immunohistochemical marker is the latent nuclear antigen for HHV8, which helps in the confirmation of diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma. Coming to the next category of intermediate vascular tumor, vascular tumor of intermediate malignancy, which is a locally aggressive one, is a Kaposi form hemangioendothelioma. This Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma most commonly occurs in children with presentation in the first year of life or infancy. They can occur in the superficial tissues as well as this deep soft tissue location and also various visceral sites like uh, kidneys, liver, lung as well as the bones. And this hemangioendothelioma is commonly associated with Casabac merit phenomena which is a consumption cardiopathy. Coming to the morphology of Kaposi's form hemangioendothelioma, it has a, like the name suggests, Kaposi form. It has both spindle cells as well as the vascular channels. So in low power, we can see presence of these lobules, the small, small lobules or what we call as a cannonball-like or a glomeruloid proliferation of spindle cells. So in the center, we have the spindle cells and the periphery, we can appreciate some slit-like vascular channels. So once we go to high power, again we can see presence of this glomeruloid-like proliferation. And at the periphery of every glomerulus, we have this slit-like vascular channels. And the immunohistochemistry is also very characteristic. The vascular channels at the periphery of the glomeruloid structures are positive for lymphatic markers, whereas the cells or the spindle cells or the capillary channels which are present within the glomerulus are positive for the endothelial markers like CD31 and CD34. 
so this I am including here. This is a benign entity, which is an acquired tufted angioma. So this acquired tufted angioma is like a continuum lesion of there is a lot of genetic as well as morphological relation between tufted angioma and the kaposiform hemangioendothelioma. It has an identical morphological pattern and but the clinical course is benign and indolent and it is seen more in older children in adults when compared to the infants or very younger children. So it is said some uh, in books they have mentioned that if you have a very benign indolent lesion with same morphology and the age patient is older, consider it as tufted angioma. And if the child it occurs in a very young child or infant, we should consider it as a aggressive kaposiform hemangioendothelioma. And both of them have a genetic similarity of having a point mutations in the GNA14, which is a G alpha receptor uh, delayed. It causes upregulation of the G-alpha receptor with increase in the MAP kinase pathway. These uh, GNAQ and GNA14 point mutations are also identified in other benign vascular tumors like anastomosing hemangioendothelioma, hepatic small vessel neoplasm, and lobular capillary hemangioendothelioma. So moving on to the benign entities. So the benign entities can be a malformator process, a reactive vascular proliferation or hemangiomas. Hemangiomas is a proliferation of the vascular channels disproportionately and some of the hemangiomas may involute. And But malformations are the malformed vascular channels which is an abnormality of development. They appear at birth and they don't have much of a proliferative activity and they don't involute as frequently as hemangiomas. And the reactive vascular proliferations, like previously the lobular capillary hemangioma or the pyogenic granuloma or bacillary angiomatosis or Mason's tumor all come under the reactive vascular proliferations. So we have a very long list of benign vascular tumors and uh, discussing all of that in this one hour is difficult. So. I will discuss the important ones and those which mimic the malignant vascular tumors. So starting with this uh, tumors which are common in children, hemangiomas in children are the infantile hemangioma and congenital hemangioma. So infantile hemangiomas are hemangiomas which develop in an infant few weeks after birth before the first month and then it involutes. So it has three growth phases. First phase is the proliferative phase where there is increase in the vascular lesion and the proliferative phase can occur from birth to the first year of life and from the 12 months or the first year of life to 12 years of life there is a plateau phase where the hemangioma regresses and finally there is an involution phase after 12 years where there is total involution of this infantile hemangioma. It can occur in any site, but it is common in the head and neck region. Coming to the morphology of infantile hemangioma, it is usually a circumscribed lesion located in the dermis or subcutaneous tissue. And in low power, we can see these are arranged in a big lobular pattern. So in contrast to the hemangiomas angiomas or the kaposiform hemangioendothelioma, which we discussed now, which also occurs in children, they have a small cannonball or glomeruloid-like spindle cells which are bordered by crescentic cells. But these are the high flow lesions which have very large lobules of capillary proliferations and these within the lobules and between the lobules also we see presence of this large feeding arteries which are supplying blood to the smaller vessels. And these small capillaries usually are not well formed, so we don't find any well developed lumina. Instead, we find presence of this spindle cells within that solid area. Uh, or it can also become a well formed lesion, but most of the time we have an ill formed vascular channel filled with blood or no uh, vascular lumen at all and a spindle cell. And within this lesion, we can also find mitotic activity. So the presence of mitotic activity should not be alarming or we should not make it a malignant tumor. It is normal to find mitosis during the proliferative phase of this uh, infant and hemangioma. As it regresses, we can see presence of this well-formed vascular channels. 
and uh, there will be increase in the fibrous matrix between the vascular channels with complete involution of the lobules and the small capillary channels being replaced by this fibrotic matrix what remains are the large feeding arteries with collagenized walls and they these infantile hemangiomas have a very unique immunohistochemical markers which are present in the uh, placental blood endothelial cells and the blood tissue barriers which are the glucose transporter 1 lewis y antigen fc gamma receptor and merosine so we can uh, take help of this glucose transporter 1 when a differential diagnosis arises between an infantile or congenital hemangioma or a kaposiform hemangioendothelioma or infantile hemangioma so this is the only tumor which shows presence of this glue transporter 1 expression and uh, these infantile hemangiomas can present as a focal, multifocal, segmental distribution along the nerve, like in trigeminal nerve or an indeterminate pattern of distribution. And if there is a facial segmental uh, distribution along the trigeminal uh, nerve, is a hallmark sign for the phase anomalies, which are the posterior brain fossa abnormalities, hemangiomas, arterial. Uh, cardiovascular and eye abnormality syndrome which is a face syndrome and if these infantile hemangiomas are multifocal that if there are more than five cutaneous infantile hemangiomas we should also screen for presence of a underlying visceral involvement especially the hepatic involvement coming to the next uh, tumor next hemangioma which is common in children is the congenital hemangioma as the name suggests, it is congenital, so it is present since birth, and it is fully grown at birth. And from there, the lesion can undergo rapid involution, or the lesion can be non-involuting and persist as such. And based upon that, they have divided it into non-involuting congenital hemangioma, or the niche, and the rapid involuting congenital hemangioma, which is the niche. And uh, these tumors showed mutations in... Uh, this GNAC and GNA11 genes. Coming to morphology, there are relatively circumscribed uh, lesions and within this we see presence of these large lobules of solid proliferation of spindle cells and the vascular channels. And these vascular channels have very prominent endothelial cells and mitotic activity can also be seen. Though we have the rapidly involuting and the non-involuting categories, and there are also partially involuting categories, there are no histological picture or histological features which can point us whether this will involute or not. And uh, post-involution, we are left with this uh, vascular channels with increased fibrous matrix in between, and uh, there is complete uh, banishing of the lobular architecture in case of involuted congenital hemangioma. So in phases of involution, when we cannot differentiate congenital from infantile hemangioma, we can use the GLUT1 IHC, which is not expressed in congenital hemangioma. So coming to the next benign vascular lesion, which is the epitheloid hemangioma, which is also called as angiolymphoid hypoplasia with uh, eosinophilia. So this epithelial hemangioma was previously considered in between a reactive versus neoplastic kind of lesion, but now it is included at a neoplastic lesion as it shows the recurrent fusions in the FOS and FOSP genes in more than 50% of patients. And this epithelial hemangioma is common in the young to middle age group. It has no female predominance unless like the Kimura's disease. And the most common sites are head and neck, periauricular zone, distal extremities, oral mucosa, and rarely intraosseous site. And uh, based upon the morphology, this epithelial hemangioendothelioma have a conventional subtype and the subtype with a lot of inflammation, which is angiolymphoid hypoplasia with eosinophilia subtype. And there is a subtype which shows a solid proliferation of tumor cells with more than 50% cellularity and sheet like growth pattern, which is a cellular subtype. So this is a conventional subtype. So the most characteristic feature of epithelial hemangioendothelioma is a proliferation of vascular channels having the nuclei having a distinct hobnailing and an epithelial future. So if we see in this lesion, there are so many proliferating vascular channels and we should have this cigar-shaped or hobnailing-shaped prominent epithelioid 
endothelial cells before making the diagnosis of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. Sorry, epithelioid hemangioma. And in the angiotic lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia variant, apart from these proliferation of vascular channels showing prominent endothelial cells, we also have a lot of inflammation. And the inflammation can be composed of lymphocytes, plasma cells, rarely lymphoid follicles with germinal center formation, and eosinophils can also pre predominate. And in these cases, we have a differential diagnosis, which is Kimura's disease. So the difference between ALHE and Kimura's disease is Kimura's disease most commonly presents in the lymph node as a lymphadenopathy with, with or without a soft tissue involvement and they are associated with peripheral eosinophilia and increased in IgE and the inflammatory component is the main component in Kimura's disease where we see a lot of eosinophils, germinal centers and we also have a lot of fibrosis which is like a sclerosing fibrosis present around the veins and fibrotic bands, whereas in epithelioid hemangioma, we don't see any fibrotic bands. In uh, Kimura's disease, this presence of prominent endothelial cells and proliferation of the vascular channels is less prominent. It is more of an inflammatory lesion, but in ALHE, it is more of a vascular lesion, predominates more than the inflammation. And the other variant of epithelioid hemangioma is a cellular epithelioid hemangioma, where we have this... Uh, epithelioid to lobated nuclei with eosinophilic cytoplasm giving the epithelioid look. So some mitotic activity can be found and these tumors can have some inflammation in the periphery and uh, slit-like vascular formation filled with hemorrhage and the epithelioid hemangiomas are uh, the diagnostic difficulty to differentiate from epithelioid malignant tumors like epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, the solid version and uh, with the TFE3 fusion and the epithelioid angiosarcomas. But in contrast to epithelioid angiosarcoma, the nuclear atypia is not that profound and the mitotic activity is also uh, not as much, not very high, and uh, we don't have any mixoid matrix or cord like arrangement which is seen in the epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. But this is, and the borders are also circumscribed in case of epithelioid hemangioma with a multinodular pattern with no infiltration into surrounding tissues. But in case of doubt, we can use the false B immunohistochemistry. The false B IHC is diffusely positive in epithelioid hemangioma, whereas negative in angiosarcomas and hemangioendothelioma. Another benign entity is the hobnail hemangioma. This hobnail hemangioma has a resemblance to a well-differentiated angiosarcomas. This hobnail hemangioma is also known as targetoid hemocidric hemangioma and it occurs in young children with a wide age range. Coming to the morphology, we can see that here in the superficial dermis, the lesion is having this dilated vascular channels and then they dissect it deeper into the planes. It is not very prominent here, but they dissect into the dermal planes deeply. But we don't see dilated structures in the deeper dermis, whereas the dilated structures are present in the upper dermis. In addition to this, we also have a lot of inflammation in case of hobnail hemangioma with hemosiderin laden macrophages. So this is a superficial dermis where we see this dilated spaces lined by this endothelial cells which are showing hobnailing like pattern like they are protruding instead of being flattened and because of this dissection into the deeper dermal vessels we have a differential diagnosis of uh, malignant tumors and because of this prominence of this endothelial cell we consider a nuclear atypia so tilt more towards a malignant tumor but we should be careful about the pattern we should look at the pattern in general of this superficial dilated vascular channels and then narrow slit like spaces in the deeper dermis so this low power picture is very important to study to differentiate hormonal hemangioma from other malignant tumors so other uh, benign vascular lesion is the spindle cell hemangioma. Previously, it was considered as low-grade sarcoma and also misinterpreted as hemangioendothelioma. Now, it is under a benign category. The spindle cell hemangioma 
Ajurma occurs in young adults, but it has a wide age range. It occurs in distal extremities, chest wall, head and neck, and oral cavity. And in about 70% of cases, we find IDH1 and 2 mutations in spindle cell hemangiomas. Coming to the morphology of spindle cell hemangioma, as this is a benign entity, we don't see much of uh, irregular borders. It is a well circumscribed border. But we should be aware that the spindle cell hemangiomas can be multifocal. So presence of because of presence of multifocality, we should not mistake them as a malignant tumors. And uh, just like hemangio, just like Kaposi sarcomas, they have two components, which is a spindle cell component and the vascular component. But here in spindle cell hemangioma, the vascular component are present as like a dilated vascular spaces. And some of the vascular spaces can show thrombi. And then we have this spindle cell component alternating this with this cavernous dilated vascular spaces and this spindle cell component is usually blunt they do not show much of atypia and there is no mitotic activity in spindle cell hemangiomas there are extravasation of rbcs and hemocyte related macrophages can be found because of presence of this uh, lymphatic component and spindle cell component the differential diagnosis is kaposi sarcoma but we should notice that the Vascular component in spindle cell and angioma, hemangioma is present as the dilated cavernous like vascular spaces and not the lymphatic like vascular spaces which are seen in Kaposi So coming to the vascular malformations. So vascular malformations are present at birth. They grow proportionate to the host and they are aggregates of vessels. As I said, they don't have a normal organization which is seen in hemangiomas. And based upon the type of vessel involved, there can be simple vascular malformation. So in simple, there is malformation of just a capillary or venous malformation, arterial malformation or a lymphatic malformation. Whereas in combined, we can have an arterial venous malformation or a venocapillary malformation when there are two kind of vascular channels involved. We call it a combined vascular malformation. And many of the vascular malformations are syndrome associated like Peten hematoma syndromes, Osler Weber Redu syndrome, like that. And there are some unclassified uh, categories of vascular malformations. So these vascular malformations uh, usually, it is helpful to identify when we are provided with a clinical history that they are present since birth. But many times, these vascular malformations can be located superficially or they can have a deep location. When the location is deep, even in clinical picture, they may not be able to identify whether it is present since birth or it has it is an acquired lesion. So this is the most common capillovenous malformation, which is also called as portwine stain or nevus flemius. It shows distribution along the fifth nerve and it can present with uh, Sturge Weber syndrome. And it can also have a uh, Klippel Genoni syndrome with lymph hypertrophy. So this is composed of disorganized vascular channels which have a very irregular border. They're not very well circumscribed. And the vessels show both capillary as well as venous differentiation. This is called as nevius flemius or a portwine stain. So the other category of simple uh, vascular malformation is a venous hemangioma. So in this, we see presence of this abnormal venous channels, which are present very irregularly. They have a very thickened vessel wall with muscularization. We don't see presence of any arteriovenous communication in case of venous hemangiomas. And very frequently we find presence of vascular thrombi within this venous channel. These venous hemangiomas are associated with a blue rubber blood nevus syndrome where it presents as a blue nodular venous malformation. They are deeply located so they look very blue and they involve the dermis and subcutaneous tissue and it, it can also occur in the gastrointestinal tract. So other common malformation or hemangioma which we come across is the arteriovenous malformation. This is a very high flow malformation. It is present in children and adults. It can be located superficially where we call a sursoid and aneurysm or it can have a deep location. And the frequent finding is head and neck, limbs, lungs and uterus. 
So one thing to notice here is though these are the benign tumors or the vascular malformations, the location is very critical. Like the presence of arteriovenous malformation in a head and neck is very devastating when it produces some hemorrhage in the brain. So the prognosis entirely depends upon the location of these tumors, although they are very benign. And uh, since they have a very ill-defined border, the excision is also challenging in case of malformation. And the local recurrence rate is high. And this arteriovenous malformations can present with hypertrophy, like in here we have a unilateral limb hypertrophy because of the high flow to that limb. It can have heart failure and consumption coagulopathy or Casabac merit phenomenon. So in uh, arteriovenous malformation, what we see is communication between the arteries and venous channels and because of the communication there is a high pressure flow in the venous channels because of which the veins start developing a muscular layer around it of variable thickness and to differentiate a muscularized vein from an artery we can do an elastic van Giesen stain which highlights the internal elastic lamina present in the artery whereas it is absent in the vein and we can see presence of this disorganized vascular channels and instead of the hemangiomas which we the vascular tumors or hemangiomas which are closely packed channels these are separated by normal interstitium and these are very difficult to excise because they are not circumscribed so these are all the tumors, malignant, uh, malignant, benign and the intermediate tumors. I, though there are much more uh, hemangiomas, I think we can just read it since they do not come into differential diagnosis and it is it will take a lot of time. But the take home points from this lecture is before making a diagnosis, the clinical context is very important. Like the age of onset, whether it is from the birth and the age of the patient, location, history of radiation, history of immunosuppression, history of any foreign implants or AV fistulas. And if we see any tumor which is having uh, any vascular tumor which is having infiltrating margins, dissecting kind of growth pattern, anastomosing channels, and the endothelium is showing multi-layering and cytological atypia, just pause for a second, look at it very carefully and so that we don't over-diagnose a benign tumor or under-diagnose angiosarcomas. And we should be beware of the pitfalls of immunohistochemistry, like cytokeratin positivity in epithelioid hemangioendothelioma and epithelioid uh, angiosarcomas, as well as pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. We should not mistake them for carcinomas or epithelioid sarcoma. And CD31 interpretation, where CD31 can be positive in macrophages. And ERG, though it highlights nuclear, it's a nuclear marker for uh, endothelial cells. It can also be expressed in other myeloid tumors and a subset of prostatic adenocarcinomas. And we should always be conscious of the benign tumors which mimic malignancy and the vascular tumors versus the epithelial tumors in case of cytokeratin positivity. And to differentiate a typical vascular lesion from post-radiation induced sarcomas, we use SMIC3. And there is a new distinct entity of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, which lacks the cord-like pattern, it lacks the fibromyxoid pattern, and it has a vasoformation and abundant cytoplasm. We can do TFE3 immunohistochemistry, and it is the epithelioid hemangioendothelioma with the one TFE3 translocation. And to differentiate epithelioid hemangiomas from other epithelioid malignant tumors, FOSB immunohistochemistry is helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very extensive. You must be very tired. Uh, can, can you see your chat box? Uh, On the top right side. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are some comments and questions by Professor Pranab Bhattacharya. If you, if you feel you can answer them or you can answer them later, depending upon your choice. You want me to read them to you? I can read them to you as well. Yes, sir. Should I read them? Uh, yes. Okay, this you can do it. said cutaneous epithelioid angiosarcomas have large round or polygonal epithelioid cells arranged in solid sheets or nest 
they have a basophilic and eosinophilic cytoplasm yes this uh, epithelial angiosarcoma they describe has a bit of amphophilic kind of cytoplasm vesicular nuclei prominent nucleoli and they say mitotic figures including abnormal mitosis are frequently encountered and what are the risk factors for development of angiosarcomas as the the clinical scenario the picture itself has said that the risk factors include post radiation induced sarcomas lymphedema associated sarcomas in addition to that even the implants or the foreign material are also seen to be a risk factors for angiosarcomas and av fistulas especially for renal transplant patient and in case of hepatic angiosarcomas we have the toro trust which and the which has a very specific association with uh, hepatic angiosarcomas and also vinyl chloride used in the rubber industry and uh, some arsenic trioxide i think which is used in pesticides or these are risk factors for development of angiosarcomas the 34 and 31 are described as sensitive markers for endothelial origin in epithelioid and 20 to 30% of hemangioendotheliomas do metastasize and 50% die of disease yes i didn't describe the prognosis of the tumor so the angiosarcomas have the most poor prognosis with more than 50% of patients dying within first year of diagnosis and 20% of patients develop metastasis distant metastasis to lung bone and uh, visceral organs and brain and uh, epithelial hemangioendotheliomas 20% of these metastases as sir has already mentioned right the mimickers are the ones which are the real problem creates. yes yeah especially the ones which look like a simple hemangioma but actually they are uh, angiosarcoma and the, the ones which you showed as the, the cutaneous ones Yes. And the and the case which you shared of Sanjay Kakkar, that's a real difficult one. Yes, sir. It was a very like you can't yeah. forget once you see. Yeah, yeah, true. Yes. I mean, the first go, you think it's absolutely normal. There's nothing there. It's just fragmented biopsy of liver. Fragmented, yeah, non-representative biopsy. But then when you see those small, small cells, that's yes, the time. Sir. Yeah. Wonderful present presentation, Dr. Gitanjali. As usual. You are an expert in soft tissue. I would say, fantastically done. Thank you for consenting to come and speak on this. And you know, we are now having 150 lectures up front. Thank you for contributing to that. Thank you so much. God bless you. Please share the PDF of this lecture. We will upload it for the students. Right? Sure. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Bye.